Hi guys, welcome to another session of RBI 247. My name is Mansi Anand and a warm welcome to all of you. So as you all know that in this video, in these sessions, we try to discuss five questions that can be of use to you if you are preparing for competitive exams. So guys, let's not waste any time and move straight away to the lecture. But before doing that, I would like to ask you guys to subscribe to our channel. So if you are coming to our channel for the first time and this is the first video that you are watching, then do not forget to hit the subscribe button and don't forget to press this bell icon which can help you to get notified whenever a new video comes up. You can also join our telegram group. On this group, you can post all of your doubts and queries and we'll try to resort them as soon as possible. So are you ready for question number one? Here is your question number one. This question talks about price risk. So it gives you some statement about price, price risk and you have to select the ones which are not correct. Moving ahead to the solution and the correct option for this question is option C. Option C means only 3 is incorrect, right? Rest 2 are correct. The third one is incorrect. See, first of all, let us try to understand what is the meaning of price risk. Right? See, risk obviously signifies some kind of loss and here it says price risk. That means so a possibility of a loss that is because of change in prices of goods or services. And in case we are talking about financial markets, then a possibility of loss in case the price of your investment changes. So that is price risk. Right? Very simple concept. So, uh, some economists have been citing that uh, the farmers protest which has been going on in New Delhi, that is because of, uh, that is also because they are, uh, they are having doubts about the prices of their crops falling in future, they might not be getting the minimum selling price, right. So, some, uh, some experts are citing that farmers are also facing this fear of price risk, which is making them protest, right. So that is one aspect when we talk about goods and services. If we come to financial markets and if we talk about investments, then the change in the value of your investments refer to price risk. Let's say you have shares of a company and that company goes bust or it, it uh, uh, there are some rumors about it that that company is not very good. It has some sort of corporate governance issues. In that case, the price of that share is going to fall and you are going to face this price risk situation, right? There are many tools to mitigate it, right? First, and the, I think the most popular one is diversification, that you do not invest in similar kind of securities. You put your eggs in different baskets so that if anything bad happens to one sector, other sectors investments are safe, right? So, uh, for example, if you are talking, if you are investing some of your money into pharma sector, then you are going to put some of your money into automobile sector, right? So, or if you are going to put some money into automobile, then you are also putting some money into companies which are manufacturing electronic vehicles. So, that demand for electronic vehicles rises and if traditional and demand for traditional vehicles go down, your investments are balanced, right? So, uh, these sort of strategies are known as diversification, right? Other strategy is hedging. What is the meaning of hedging? Hedging means putting your money into some other investment that is going to safeguard your investment. We are going to understand it with the help of an example, right? So, let's say uh, you are having... Uh, you are having some investments and then you are having some doubts, you are having some apprehensions Then th th that the price of this particular commodity, this particular share is going to go down. Then what can you do? You can indulge into short selling of that particular price, sorry, of that uh, particular financial commodity. Let's say there is a company called X Limited. Currently, its price is rupees 100, but you are having doubts that this might go down then what can you do you can uh, you can indulge into short selling of this particular security what is the meaning of short selling we have discussed it in detail in one of our previous sessions if you're not aware you can ask for that videos link in the comments and learn about it 
in brief short selling means selling something selling something that you do not own you borrow that thing and then you sell it and after that you uh, you try to complete you try to square off your position or you try to complete your position by uh, by doing the delivery of that particular commodity so if there is a share of rupees 100 and you want to short sell it let's say you lock its price at rupees 98 you enter into a contract for selling let's say 1000 shares of this particular company which are valued at rupees 100 per share currently but you are doubting that it is going to go down that is why you enter into a contract in which you sell it at 98 per share so even if the price goes down to 90 you have Lock the price at 98 for you. So, in, the, in that case, you have limited some of your loss, right? So, in this way, so this short selling comes as a part of derivative, right? So, in this way, derivatives can help you to hedge price risk. In the case you are having doubts about some investments, price falling, you can help, you can take the help of derivatives, you can hedge your, your price risk in that situation right so uh, uh, in one of the videos there was a doubt by someone that how derivatives can help in hedging so this was one example right i hope now you are clear about this topic uh, some more details about price risk i think we have discussed most of it risk of decline in the value of security small startup companies generally have higher price risk than larger because obviously larger companies are well capitalized they have a good stock of money and that is why they do not have to worry about uh, anything bad happening or any changes in the business environment that can have a huge impact on small companies right for example covid is one uh, one factor that can harm the companies right so large companies they uh, might be less affected than smaller companies certain commodity industries they are more vulnerable to price changes like oil oil silver gold you remember oil prices going into negative territory in the beginning of this year gold gold prices rising in this entire year right so some of the commodities they are more vulnerable to price changes most common mitigation technique diversification we just learned about it price risk can be hedged through the purchase of financial derivatives right and maybe capitalize so if you are short selling then you can also capitalize if uh, if the uh, value of that particular share or financial commodity falls too much and you have logged in it at a certain higher price in that case you can also earn money that is how beers earn money in the stock market right so going back to the statements here you can see first statement is correct second is correct we have discussed both of these and third is not correct because price risk is hedged through the purchase of financial derivatives rather than being amplified right although derivatives can amplify a certain type of risks but price risk they help to hedge right moving ahead to next question okay here is your second question for today which says what does it refer to two statements given to you and you have to tell what is the meaning of it in these two statements moving ahead to the solution correct option for this question is option d that is last mile logistics so guys if you are an avid newspaper reader you must have read this term in newspaper last mile delivery or last mile logistics right so basically this means that delivering to the consumer where the money has been put sorry let's try to understand this with the help of an example let's say you have placed an order on amazon let's say you have ordered new running shoes right now you are waiting for your shoes to come eagerly and uh, in the in early morning you receive a message that your your order has been shipped right you are very happy because your order has been shipped and you might receive it in the day so that particular order is going to go to a warehouse nearest warehouse in your uh, near your area and 
uh, from that warehouse it is going to come to your place right so this last connectivity from the warehouse from the nearest warehouse to your own house this delivery is known as last mile delivery basically reaching the final consumer or the end part of the supply chain is known as last mile delivery as you can see here last step of the product journey takes place from warehouse shelf to customer's doorstep right now why is this particular last part of the supply chain really important this is very important because this is one of the most significant part of the supply chain as well as expensive as well as time consuming because see if these shoes we assume that these shoes are getting manufactured in bangalore right and for from bangalore let's say you live in delhi they have to be shipped to delhi so the entire products many products uh, they are going to be shipped from bangalore to delhi right and now in delhi they have to be put at a certain warehouse and from that warehouse they have to be delivered to your home right so see from bangalore to delhi there must be like really uh, there must be many products that have to be shipped just like you many people must have ordered products that have to come from bangalore to delhi so there are two the, the, the order size is very large that has to be shipped from bangalore to delhi but the point is the journey from this this warehouse to your home that might not consist of a large order right so that might consist of a very small order let's say if you are in a metro city like delhi then to uh, it might be a big order but if you live in some remote area if you live in some uh, remote village area of uh, of uh, let's say rajasthan or you live in somewhere in jharkhand or odisha right where connectivity is not very good then uh, this might become really expensive because the company has to ship uh, one product just one product your shoes from their house to your home right and in case see when too many products are shipped in one go then the cost becomes down cost of shipping one product becomes down right but when only one product has to be transferred the cost of transportation is very high that is why this last mile logistics especially in the remote area they are very high that is the reason many companies they do not deliver in some remote areas right and they are very comfortable in deliver delivering to areas in metro cities right so companies are innovating that how can we reduce the cost for this last mile delivery so that we can uh, we can make delivery faster for the uh, customers right so this is one area where innovation has been going on uh, it can be using drones to deliver in areas where roads are not very good or connectivity is not very easy or it it might refer to uh using whatsapp to connect the nearby retailers to de to de deliver uh, some products right so especially in case of food products which have to be delivered really fast and which which might get destroyed or damaged after a certain period of time in case of perishable goods this last mile delivery be innovation becomes really important right some more information about last mile logistics in addition to customer satisfaction last mile delivery is both most expensive and time consuming part of the process final leg of the shipment involves multiple stops with low drop sizes as i just told you see in urban areas the proximity is quick because connectivity is easy but that might get negated by traffic right so connectivity might be easy but there can be a lot of traffic which can hamper the transportation so with the growing trend of free shipping right we do not want to pay for shipping or we do not like to pay for orders we try to uh, we, we we try to order beyond a certain limit so that we do not have to pay shipping because we consider at as a consumer we consider it as a waste of money that why should i pay rupees 100 on my mintra order uh just for shipping right i'm going to shop more than 1000 or more than 1500 so that i don't have to pay the shipping charges so customers are uh, the trend of free shipping is growing and customers are less willing to pay money for delivery that is why companies have to innovate there because see they have pushed this trend that is why they have to carry it forward and for this 
they can uh, partner up with the local retailers and they can uh, transfer their contracts to niche logistics companies who have the specialization in this particular field new technologies and drive process improvements so guys this uh, this we were talk, talking about in the context of e-commerce but if we talk about financial services then also last mile delivery is very important let's say if we talk about banking services how are you going to transfer banking services to someone limit uh, living in a very remote village or are atms able to penetrate such areas right so for financial inclusion also uh, not only in the e-commerce segment last mile also plays an important role in the process of financial inclusion because the more regulators and uh, regulators are com and companies are uh, they are able to innovate the more uh, we would be able to include people from remote areas to to join this uh, bandwagon of financial inclusion right so it also plays so for this uh, um, in many places there are local banks who can easily connect with the customers or there are neo banks who, uh, which do not depend on physical establishment they work on online modes right so certain innovations are being carried out in this area moving ahead to the next question so here is the third question which says select the correct statement about the topic of expenses moving ahead to the solution correct option is option b option b means discretionary expenses are usually referred to as bonds and non discretionary expenses are referred to as needs first of all we have to understand the difference between discretionary and non discretionary expenses right okay here i am going to give you some examples let's say you are ordering rice from grofers right your mother has told you to bring some rice and since it is really cold outside you do not want to go out and you want to uh you, you just want to sit in blanket and read your favorite book that is why you order rice from grofers right and after that let's say your friend's birthday is approaching and you want to uh, uh you want to buy a new dress for the birthday party and for that you order a dress from mintra right so in both the cases see do you think which one do you think is really important or really essential obviously the first part because if you do not order rice then your mother is going to scold you no that is not the reason if you do not order rice then obviously uh, rice being a food commodity is very essential you need to eat food you need to cook and for that you need to order food right but can you do without ordering this dress from mintra because you have so many clothes in your wardrobe you can wear something that you own right you do, you do, it is not necessary that you buy a new dress for your friend's birthday party right so this first one is an example of non discretionary expenses because see they are essential in nature you cannot go on without spending on them whereas the second example is example of discretionary expenses which are non essential in nature and we spend on them just to fulfill our wants or just to spend on luxuries right so this is the difference between discretionary and non discretionary so whenever a country is going through recession discretionary expenses of people fall because obviously uh, their incomes fall they have lesser money and they try to cut down the expenses so if you are going through any financial distress do you think you are going to watch a movie in theater or you are going to eat out in your favorite cafe no you are not going to do, do that because you can save money there but obviously you have to pay your kids school fee or you have to uh, you you have to get uh, you have to get uh, groceries for kitchen right so that is the difference between discretionary and non discretionary if we talk about the current times government is trying to boost the discretionary consumption or they are trying to pull up the discretionary con uh, consuming tendency of people because see most of the part of economy they are dependent upon discretionary expenses that consumers make that is why see whatever you buy 
बी इट अड्रेस बी इट शूज बी इट कॉस्मेटिक्स और बी इट एनी बी इट एनी एक्सरसाइजिंग स्टफ वर्कआउट स्टफ राइट सो all these things they somehow lead to income generation for the producers of these goods or services not only goods uh, let's say if you go out to parlors or if you go out to to uh, salons right uh, if you go out to eat in your favorite cafes so all those manufacturers and all those providers of services they depend on you for their livelihood that is why when you spend you generate income for them and in case of recessions in times of uh, in hard times such as covid 19 people limit their consumption or expense, ex expenses to non discretionary and they do not indulge in discretionary expenses at least people who have limited amount of money right so government is trying to uh, push uh, people into doing discretionary spending so that economy can get a boost right moving ahead to the to more details okay discretionary it refers to cost that a business household can get by without if necessary right so they can do without spending on it they, those are discretionary expenses often defined as non essential or in other words wants rather than need so they are wants you want something you it, it is not necessary that you need it tracking discretionary expenses enables businesses and households to identify where they can save money in times of financial difficulties as i just told you that in covid uh, probably there are more chances of you not shopping or not buying something new in terms of clothes or shoes but obviously you have to buy food which is essential or you have to pay kids uh, you have to pay for kids education discretionary expenses rarely have anything to do with the business or households day to day operations instead they have to do with lifestyle and choice they do not affect day to day operations they affect your lifestyle and choice when times are good people have more money and they can do more discretionary spending and they can spend on luxury items and other services such as cars vacations eating out etc right okay moving ahead to next question question number 4 Okay I hope the screen is perfectly visible this question says which of the following tells you about the correct interpretation of kuznets curve so this was asked by one of you in the comments moving ahead to the solution the solution says that the correct option is c c means industrializing nations industrializing nations experience a rise and then a subsequent decline in economic inequality So, uh, so here we are talking about one economist research who is called Simon Kuznets, right? So this particular economist he said one thing. He said when economies industrialize, when industries are growing in a particular economy, then what happens is the first effect is there is a rise in the inequality, and then slowly. and gradually the inequality starts declining right because see when any when countries industrialize or they are on the capitalist path then they generate profit for a certain section of society and that profit rests within the hands of certain uh, certain rich people or you can say industry owners uh, who are generating profit out of it since the employees are getting their fixed wages that is why inequality is increasing because the richer are becoming richer and the uh, and the poorer are staying at the same level since richer are becoming richer they are spending more they are raising the inflation leading to poorer becoming more uh, becoming uh, more poor right so initially inequality rises but as the businesses grow profits grow unemployment uh, sorry uh, unemployment vanishes and employment rises in that case this inequality it starts to fall and gradually somehow move towards an equal society because obviously if if businesses are uh, making profit some profit is going to get transferred to the uh, to the employees to the laborers right so some benefit they are also going to get out of it so at first industrial industrializing nations experience a rise in inequality and then a subsequent decline right 
Okay, moving ahead. Here you can see the correct answer. See, inequality income per capita rising. Income per capita rising, inequality first rising and then going down. So this is making an inverted U shape, which is known as a Kuznets curve, right? So this particular economist, he thought that he had an idea before doing the research that uh, with in increasing income or with increasing industrialization, inequality must be rising. But after the research, he experienced this result. See. He thought economic inequality would increase as rural labor migrated to cities, keeping the wages down as workers competed for job. So he thought that uh, when, when there is more industrialization, rural labor, they migrate to cities and it keeps the uh, inflow of labor going on, which leads to uh, supply of labor driving down the wages, right? But according to his research, social mobility increases again once a certain level of income was reached in modern industrialized economies as the welfare state takes hold. After that, when, uh, when this happens too much uh, and uh, labor, uh, the, the laborers, they also become powerful, they engage into trade unions and stuff and they try to uh, take some proportion of the benefit toward themselves, increasing the social benefit. Moving ahead, so there is an interpretation of this curve which has been put into environmental aspect. So it relates industrialization with pollution levels in developing economies. Here you can see. So they say when economies industrialize, pollution first rises and then gradually it starts decreasing. Why is it so? Because obviously, see, economies are industrializing. There are more businesses opening. They are going to generate a lot of waste. They are going to produce more, which is going to pollute the environment. But once it reaches, reaches its peaks, there are going to be environmentalists. There, there are going to be debates about it. And there are going to be, they are going to be held accountable for these actions. And some people, since there is a rise in income at a macro level so some people are going to become aware and some people are going to uh, invest or innovate into environmental environmental environment friendly startups or environment friendly companies or they are going to spend on organic products which are non polluted right so as income rises they are going to move towards an economic uh, an eco friendly way of living right that is going to drive down pollution here you can see uh, the same thing that we have just discussed. Moving ahead to the next question. Here is your last question for today, which says Dash describes countries experiencing high rates of unemployment even during periods of economic growth. Moving ahead to the answer and the correct option for this question is Eurosclerosis. Okay. So obviously this term comprises of Euro. You can assume that it has something to do with Europe or European countries. Right? See, Eurosclerosis term, uh, if you remember in the session when we discussed about Japan's lost ticket, we discussed about a term called Japanification, right? So, Japanification refers to any country which has been going through a stagnant rate of growth just as Japan did and is also going through currently, right? So, although this contains Japan, but it has become a, gener a generic term for any country, right? Same goes for Eurosclerosis. So, it refers to any country that has been experiencing high rates of unemployment amidst of economic growth. So, because Europe European countries once experienced a similar situation when there was growth, but this growth led to high rates of unemployment. Usually what happens is growth drives unemployment down and it becomes and it brings employment in upward tendency. But if growth is leading to high rates of unemployment, so this might be possible because this growth is being driven by technology and people are not able to upgrade their skills to uh, to the jobs where they require human skills right so uh, all the monotonous jobs or menial jobs are being done by technology that is driving the growth 
by driving efficiency but people are not able to upgrade their skills see that that's a common notion that technology leads to loss of job but on one hand it leads to loss of jobs but then on the other hand it creates a scope for lot of jobs so it removes the uh, it removes the need for lower level jobs or unskilled jobs because the monotonous jobs or the uh, the menial jobs can be done by technology easily and then they create jobs for high skilled people and if in a country there is growing use of technology but people are not able to upgrade their skills so that they can attain those high level jobs then unemployment is going to rise right so this was uh, this was uh, a time that uh, sorry europe experience and now this euro scler uh, euro has become a generic term for any country that faces similar situation right okay here you can see refers to sluggish economic performance and high unemployment due to overly rigid markets and over regulation of the economy in the favor of established special interests so see there is growth but it is sluggish in nature and it is not very fast so there is some sort of growth but unemployment is still peeping originally applied to western europe during 1970s and 80s but today can refer to similar situations everywhere rise of technology sector limited deregulation right so the deregulation is very limited government has been taking things into their own hands they're not uh, letting the private sector develop too much which can generate a lot of employment right so limited deregulation can also lead to high rates of unemployment increased openness in labor markets as europe become more economically integrated all help to overcome euro sclerosis right so when economies they deregulate themselves and they they allow private sector to flourish and apart from that when europe uh, european countries integrated themselves i hope you remember about the european union we uh, studied about that in the session where we discussed eurozone crisis right so when they integrated themselves the mobility increased if uh, people are not finding jobs at one place they can easily move to another countries as well right so this social mobility helped in reducing the situation of euro sclerosis that this comes from a medical term sclerosis right basically it has something to do with tissues despite a generally growing economy in 70s and mid 80s the unemployment rate in european countries continuously increased so this was the situation that i was describing having some growth but having high unemployment right along with the advancement of technology solid push towards economic integration helped europe to end the era of euro sclerosis right so this is about euro sclerosis guys here i have a homework for you you have to mention in the comments that who coined up who coined this term euro sclerosis and made it popular right you have to mention the person's name uh, so guys these were the five questions for today i hope you learned something new from this video if you did then do not forget to hit the like button and here i would like to share one more thing okay we discussed this question about rbi coming up with uh, with uh, guidelines for nbfc's dividend payments right so a slide was missing then due to some technical issue here you can see the categories that they have presented and the details of the the details of the parameters that they are requiring for nbfc's to come out with dividends right in relation to this we also studied this matrix i uh, i told you that how they are going to place uh, nbfcs into certain boxes and according to that accor uh, according to those parameters they are going to decide how much uh, is an nbfc allowed to pay as dividend right so this was this is uh, these are the two matrices right here you can see if you want you can take a screenshot of it for future use right this one and this one and these are the categories right and this was the question okay so guys i'll see you in the next session till then you take care of yourselves keep your studies going on and thank you for being here